that um, the present state, uh, the actual recording starts or the reporting starts January 1 of this year, 2015. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Tyson Fuhrer. I'm with Biggs Insurance. I'm the compliance manager here and I've been working with clients over the last couple of years in trying to help them with their ACA needs um, from just the counting side of things to um, getting the attorneys involved and making sure that they're documenting everything and now the reporting is actually starting to become a much bigger um, situation for them. Um, the Affordable Care Act, which everybody knows, um, has continued to offer new and new pieces of legislation as it's being implemented to clarify um, a lot of the information um, needed to be able to uphold the mandates. One of the big sections that were added was sections 6055 and 6056. And what this did is it added new reporting rules that certain employers had to uh, abide by. And those employers are considered ALEs, applicable large employers. Um, but these ALEs were the ones that were gonna have to um, accommodate the 655 and 56 rules. And really what the, the rules are there to do is it's supposed to help the IRS really manage and administer the ACA mandates, creating some documentation trails more than anything. Um, so the pay or play rules are, are met. And if they're not, that there's penalties and the individual mandates are met. So those are for your employees. Um, and if there's not, then there's penalties. Um, what certain employers means to a client or to, a, uh, to an employer is that uh, beginning January 1 of 2015, all employers that have 50 or more full-time employees or equivalent uh, full-time employees in the preceding calendar year, so this would be 2015 if we're, or 2014 if we're talking about the 2015 reporting period, um, are going to have to meet the 6056 and 6055 rules. One of the uh, challenges is control groups. So you have many employers have different business ventures and different situations, and depending upon their level of ownership um, in those shared situations, the employees of those other companies may or may not add into all of the companies that they own um, and take a, a company above the 50 number or not. One of the things I'd like to mention real quickly is, is that there's a number of companies out there um, that are say 98 or um, 99 full-time equivalent employees and a lot of them were um, having challenges understanding the difference between the pay or play mandate that was delayed until 2016 and the reporting rules that actually started in January 1 of 2015. There's obviously a lot of things that continue to get delayed and started and stopped and it does get very confusing uh, but this is something that is in force it's happening right now and the reporting period is going to start, uh, the actual form delivery is going to actually happen in the next couple months. Okay, so counting FTEs the ACA way, the Affordable Care Act way. Um, one of the other things that the Affordable Care Act did, it did some very positive things, but at the same time it also created um, new things inside the marketplace that employers hadn't really had to accommodate for. But it, one of the things it did is it helped employers um, or made employers have to count their employees a specific way rather than just what worked for their business or their industry. Um, but the counting of employees happens during a measurement period. Typically, employers are using a 12-month look-back measurement period. So in that measurement period, the employees that were there working an average of 30 hours or more for the considered one full-time employee, okay? On top of that, anybody that's not working the 30 hours or more are becoming equivalents. The hours add up together. And the example there is, is that you have 40 full-time employees employed uh, 30 hours or more on average, plus 20 more employees employed at 15 hours per week on average. Then you have an equivalent because 20 divided, um, sorry, 15 hours, half of 30, so you got to divide that by two on those 20. So now you got 10 full-time equivalents out of those 20 part-timers. 10 plus the 40 gets you to 50. Now you got to start dealing with these rules. The other thing that's um, also been defined in the rules is seasonal employees. And those are the folks that are working in a season for 120 days or less. It's a month, it's a day thing, not a month thing. Um, some people try to simplify it by the months, but it's really by the days. And, that, and this can be very, very important when you have agricultural companies, uh, retail trade, you know, say with the shopping season that's coming up here pretty quick. Those people can be actually excluded from the counting, um, but they are sometimes or sometimes not excluded from eligibility of benefits. Um, so something to be um, aware of is, is that 
the counting rules are different than the benefit eligibility rules. And so all the counting rules are is to, to figure out, do I or do not, I not have to accommodate for the ACA reporting requirements? Then you have your benefit rules, which maybe a lot of people are at, you know, you're eligible first month after 60 days. Well, that's, that's great. And so if you have a seasonal employee that's working 90 days, well, then they possibly are going to become benefit eligible unless they're excluded out of the contract. Um, and sometimes they have been and sometimes they haven't. So those are just some of the things that have come up. Um, and it is very, very confusing because the counting versus the eligibility sometimes gets smashed together because you're using the same words. Uh, but they are very, very different things. Okay, so really, um, when we started the presentation, is what are the top three questions I need to ask myself? And one of the first ones is, are you as the employer 50 employees or more as far as an FTE count? Um, most employers nowadays are pretty clear. I mean, when you sit in, in, when I sit in front of one, they're like, are you at 50 or more? They're like, yes or no. Um, and so that's something that I think most people are aware of. Question two is really when we get into the meat um, of this presentation, and that is who is reporting the 1094 and the 1095? Um, and that's 6056 and 56, um, 6055 and 56. The 1094 reporting is part of 655, and the 1095 is really part of 6056. Those are the actual IRS documents that you have to use now to start the reporting period. Many times we run into clients that have been told for months and months that their payroll provider is going to be doing this for them or their system, their job costing system is going to be able to do that for them, uh, even though they haven't seen it yet. Um, and so this is really where the crunch is coming in. And so who is reporting is a very big question. Uh, so what I wanted to do first is start talking about which forms would you have to report or if someone is reporting on your behalf, which forms are they going to have to use? because they are different. And so what you see here is again, ALE is someone that's 50 uh, full-time employees or more. Um, on a self-insured plan, you complete the 1094C and you complete the 1095C. If you have an, an applicable large employer that has an insured plan, the prior one was self-funded plan, then you're using the 1094C and you're also using the 1095C. If you have an employer that is under 50 full-time employees and is on a self-insured plan, then you're using the 1094B and the 1095B forms. Okay, so there's basically the same thing. You'll hear 1094 and 1095 a lot, but there are different forms inside of those things. Um, and so we're going to show you here the forms in just a second, uh, but just know that the actual reporting documents are just a little bit different depending upon your size and whether you're self-funded or not. Okay, so this is what the 1094C looks for, looks at. And this is, as you can see on the top, this is an employer transmittal form. So this is something that employers collect um, and they have most of the information that's out there. Now, one thing I need to mention real quick, and you probably have heard this already, is, is that I'm not a CPA. So I'm not actually able to provide legal advice. So all the information that I'm providing in this conversation here is not legal advice. You do have to go to a CPA if you're actually trying to figure out how to fi file a tax form. Um, or maybe an attorney would be another person. A tax attorney can help you file this, um, this form. But the challenges a lot of times with the CPAs and sometimes even the tax attorneys is that they don't understand health insurance as well as your benefits broker would. Um, and so a lot of times they're going to have to get information from your benefits broker so that these forms can be filed. And, and that's really going to come to fruition on your 1095C form. But to part one of the employer form, super simple. Everyone knows, you know, everything that's in that form. Some of the things that can that start to ask great questions is certifications of eligibility. So in part two, you have A, B, C, and D. You've got four different options of which one you're offering. And all of those are critical when you're starting to report information to the IRS to make sure that you're doing it properly. We're going to assume that questions 19, 20, and 21, you're already 50 or more full-time employees. Um, but I do, I do want to notice there, number 20, is total number of 1095Cs forms filed by and or on behalf of the ALE member. Okay. Um, what this is talking about is, is that if you have an employee that's waiving coverage or you're not offering coverage or they're enrolled, you have to provide 1095Cs to all of those employees. Um, and so the number that you put in there is going to be tracked against the number of filings that the employees that re received a 1095C are submitting. So if you put 50 in there, 
then they're going to make sure that 50 show up in the actual tax reporting. And if they don't, then they can come back and check on you with that. Back to point or part two, number 22, qualifying offer method is your standard method that you're providing. There are transition reliefs that are out there uh, for some employers, and you would probably know or not know whether you're on that. Um, you also have another section relief, uh, 4090-80H, um, and then you have the 98% offer method. Um, some people were happy when they saw the 98% offer method because it basically says that if you're providing an offer of, of affordable coverage to 98% or more of your employees, then you have a little bit less to submit um, down the road. So you still have to submit this form um, in the 1095C forms, but you have a little bit less uh, information. Okay. Um, now, the second part of the 1094C form is this second page. And so you see here, you've got minimum essential coverage on there, uh, which is not necessarily your regular fully insured plan. There's some very special and specific niche offerings of, of minimum essential coverage, uh, but your broker will be able to help you out with that and, and determine on which one of those there, there are. And then you've got your full-time employee account and your total employee account for ALD members and your aggregated group indicators. So this is if you have control groups that are going on. Notice that this is month by month. Um, some companies have a very steady workforce, and so they can use all 12 months as exactly the same to simplify that form. This is also when you are dealing with the 98% offer method, so you have a little bit less um, to be able to provide inside of this form. Um, but if you don't have a good tracking system, and you see those little bubbles for time and attendance, um, HR and benefits and payroll, all three of those things are really being used now to be able to track this stuff on a month-to-month -month basis because you're going to need it to be able to submit this form. So let's look at the 1095C form. So this is what the employer is providing to the employee so that they can file. Because remember on the 1094 form, you're saying, I'm gonna, I have 50 full-time equivalent employees or 59 or 63 or 5,212. Okay, so that means you're going to have to provide 500, 2012, 1095C forms to all of those employees that exist. These are employees that may not be working for you right now. They may have left in January, but they were on coverage back then. Okay, you still have to provide a form just like you do with the W-2. So you're tracking data throughout all 12 months, and then you're reporting that information month by month. Okay, the top part of this form, super simple, just like it was on the 1094 form. So that's the employee information there. You probably have that in payroll. Again, you see those bubbles because a lot of this stuff is going to apply. Then you start to deal with um, part two. And this is where it gets a little complicated. And typically, again, you're going to need to get your broker involved to try to get this answer. Sometimes your CPA can help, but you cannot mess this part of it up because this is where the IRS is really going to come back and be able to come back and bite you a little bit. And the penalties have gone up, even though there's a little bit of, um, I would say, relief in this first year of reporting. Um, and you see in part two, you've got offer of coverage, enter required code. Well, line 14 has got all of these codes, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 1E, 1F, 1G, 1H, 1I, okay? And it, for depending upon how your plan is set up as an employer, you may or may not have multiple codes, but you do need to know which code you're offering because, again, this is important uh, for when the employee is submitting the document. You also notice that you in the first box there, that first row, it says all 24 months. Well, okay, so if they had the same offer, you have a steady workforce, they were, they were with you all 12 months, you can just put the information in there. But let's say they weren't with you all 12 months, or maybe they went from part-time to full-time. Well, then you're going to need to be able to provide the codes inside of each one of those months and then provide the information that way. Box 15, employee share of lowest cost monthly premium or self-only minimum value coverage. Okay, So this is what the employee cost was. As you, mentioned, as you remember in the beginning of this, this document is being used to help you track the inf you track the information so that the IRS can come back and make sure that you're doing your obligations as far as the, the, sh the shared responsibility rules. The employee only coverage cost has to do with the pay or play mandate and in 2015 making sure that they didn't pay more than 9.56% of their employee only coverage. Okay, Pretty simple, but again, these are month-to-month -month type tracking mechanisms. So if you have people that come on mid-year, um, come off mid-year, or go from part-time to full-time, it can 
be a little bit challenging to get through this document, particularly if you don't have a good tracking system that's been going on. Point 16, so now you've got more codes again. These are your safe harbor codes. So you've got 2A, 2B, 2C, 2E, 2F. Um, and this is, again, where you're going to start managing and tracking which employee was on which type of coverage. Now, some industries, much more steady workforce, a lot simpler. Um, some, not. Um, so you see employee not employed during the month. Okay, well, these are people that are coming on mid-year. So, you know, they didn't come on until April. You're using 2A for January, February, March. Um, you have someone going from part-time to full-time, 2B. Um, you have employee enrolled in cover, uh, coverage offered, which is most of the employees that are going to be on this form. That's 2C. Um, and you have some other different rules down below there, 2D and 2E and 2F. Those are a little more complicated. A lot of times in the tracking systems that are out there, they're going to be asking you for these safe harbor codes. Um, and so it's important that if you have somebody that's actually reporting this information for you or tracking this information, if they really truly have been tracking this information, they would have already asked you for the answers for line 14 and line 16. And so if you don't know what those answers are right now, most likely they weren't asked, and it would be very important to make sure you update your tracking system to be able to do that. The last piece is if you're a self-insured employer, because remember if you're an ALE and self-insured, you still use the 1095C form, you also have part three to fill out. If you're fully insured, you don't have to worry about part three. But for employers that are self-insured, self-funded, um, they do have to file or deal with part three, which is dealing with dependents. And you can see their name of the covered dependent, their social security number, and, if, and it's being blocked right now. But if you don't have social security number, you can do date of birth. To the right of that is actually the uh, months that these dependents were on the plan. I'm going to back this up so you can see that a little better. Number of months that these employees were on, or the dependents were on the plan. Okay, So again, if you have someone that goes from part-time to full-time, comes on during the middle of the year, wasn't covered all 12 months, you have to check which box applies to that in each individual. Because, for example, if they came on in June, and they're worth another employer that was an applicable large employer, they're going to have a second one of these forms that they have to turn in that would show January, February, March, April, and May, and then you're showing yours from June through the end of the year. If they have all those things, they're in good shape. If they don't, it's an automatic penalty or fine. And just so you know, the penalties and fines did go up this year, so more employees are going to start asking about health coverage if, they're not, if they haven't been paying attention to it very much. So next question is 1095C form, when does that have to get out to the employee? Copies of the employees are due January 31st. Okay, so just like with their W-2, you have to get them out to the employee by January 31st. There is a way to do some delay if you're not prepared um, and you have to file an extension. It's not just granted to you. The extension can't be, well, I just basically didn't do it and now I need more time. It actually has to be a bona fide reason. Um, and so make sure that, that if you are going to need to file extension that you're working on that and that reason now. Um, another key point to this is, is that if you're uh, mailing the, the 1095C forms to the employees, it can't be with their W-2 document, even though you're sending the same in the same timeline. There'll have to be separate envelopes that are being mailed to that employee. Uh, so those are really important. If you're electronically filing, if there's some, you're permitted to do that, meaning that you're providing the 1095C form, maybe in an enrollment platform, okay? The employee has to consent. There has to be a document, a signature that the employee has said, yes, send me the 1095C form electronically, okay? Um, the same consent form is going to be similar to the other ERISA documents that are out there, but there has to be a very specific request by the employee for the 1095C by itself that says, yes, submit this thing to me electronically. Some electronic enrollment systems have already provided that consent, um, but if you don't have the consent, you can't use the electronic filing method. Okay. Um, as far as the employer and filing your return, that's the 1094 form, remember? Your returns are due to the IRS by February 28th. Um, if you're doing it electronically, um, it's March 31st. Okay. If you have a lot of returns over 250, so you got 250 belly buttons, basically, you're gonna have you would have to do electronic. Now, if you don't have someone that's actually doing your 1094 reporting for you, and you're doing it on your own, uh, maybe because you're using like a job costing system, you're in construction industry, 
system does the tracking and it may even provide a PDF of the 1095 forms, but you have to do the 1094 filing yourself, um, then there is also an additional requirement if you're doing this electronically to go online and reg register with the DOL. Um, it's not a huge, long, drawn-out process, but it definitely is a process and it's something you would want to jump on sooner rather than later. And again, you can file extensions. It's not for very long, but it has to be for good cause. Okay, It can't be just because we didn't track it. All right, so this is a screen grab from the IRS website. Just wanted to share this with you um, so you can start to estimate the amount of time if you're self reporting this information. If you're doing the 1094C form, you see the little yellow bubble there. Uh, the 1094C, uh, the IRS is saying on average you should assume that it's going to take you four hours to get that thing done. For every 1095C form you have to do, it's about 12 minutes per form. Now, understand that if you have multiple EINs in a company, that means that you have to file multiple 1094Cs. Okay, and you may have to file multiple 1095 C's. So you can see how the number of hours that this is going to come up um, to chew up as far as time. So a lot of companies are looking at technology solutions to be able to capture all this information um, and be able to do the reporting for you and on your behalf. Even though it's a new expense, it's definitely a liability expense that you probably don't want to take on um, year one or thereafter. Okay, so question one, are my a large employer? Question two, Who's doing the reporting for me? Question three, I think, is probably the most important, especially right now with crunch time coming up. Can you show me? I think that's probably the biggest question you need to be asking. You need to be shown right now who's doing the 1094. Show me the 1094 and the 1095 that you're actually producing. Where can I access the IRS codes that are being tracked, for, particularly for lines 14 and 16 for the 1095C? You really need to be tracking this information because how else are you going to be able to get it into the document otherwise? Okay. Show me how the report is calculating the FTs per month and determining your status. Show me the report that measures affordability across all three safe harbors. We mentioned those safe harbor codes. Okay. Show me how you track uh, standard and initial measurement periods, administrative stability periods, and is there a charge for somebody to access the system that has information regarding this? Some systems out there are doing that. What I can tell you from the clients that we're working with and the ones that are starting to work with us as well, is, is that most of the systems that are out there, if you don't have one that can show you all that information, most of the systems right now are going to be shut off as of October 31 to be able to add any new clients to it because it's a major resource uptake that most clients or customers out there that are providing these technology solutions are going to be able to take on too many more clients. They've already been um, barraged by new people that are needing to ask to get this done because it hasn't been being done in the past. So if you're looking at doing this and haven't done it yet, understand that the decision to have someone else do it for you is probably going to be needing to happen in the next 30 to 45 days. Okay, And then there's still going to be some work because when we've ran through implementation on this with our clients, it's typically taking 30 to 60 days to get the system up and going with the information that's needed. So if you're not loaded into a system by October 1st, you're not going to be able to get the forms out by sometime in January. The other two questions to ask, if the IRS has questions about your 1095C or 1094C filings, who's going to advocate on your behalf? If you're doing this yourself, right, Are they? Are, you know, who's going to do that for you? Do you have a tax attorney? Do you have a CPA that's going to do it for you? If that's the case, I would get that in writing. If it's your payroll company, I would definitely get that in writing. Uh, we're finding a lot of people are basically like, yeah, we're going to do this for you. But if anything comes up, um, they're not going to be held liable for the forms that are being provided. And it's it's a major, major liability. Understand that when the forms are not done, it's a maximum penalty of $500 per form, non-tax deductible. Okay. If you don't have a solution today, who is going to go back for every month of the calendar year and update the needed information for every employee? So when the IRS mentioned it's going to take 12 minutes per form, that's assuming that all the tracking and everything has been going on. Um, so I think that it's it's important to make sure that the codes are being um, tracked and the employees are being tracked, obviously, so that all this stuff can be can be done in somewhat of a timely manner. Otherwise, if you start adding this the, the time up, at the minimum, you're probably talking two to three business days for one person to be doing just these forms and having to do them accurately. I'm going to pause here for just a minute. I know we're running out of time, but just want to see if there's any questions that have, that have come up so far. Is 
So we're getting a couple questions about um, the show me part um, because a lot of people are being told that they're that it's being done. Um, I think the most critical part, the thing I would always ask on the show me part is, is that what are the IRS codes that whoever is doing this for you has entered into the system for all of that tracking? I think reports are, are important and needed um, because you, it's going to help you kind of you know, manage and judge and do the, you know, make sure that you're, you're staying within certain guidelines. But I think the number one thing in this crunch time is which codes are being used. Um, and if you haven't identified which codes there are, you certainly want to do that now. Another question on the, the B forms. So the B forms actually are very similar. Um, there's a couple of little different nuances, um, but typically um, they're, they're, it's all the same tracking information, I think is, is basically the, the, the real question there. So the B form is for uh, people that are in the shop. Um, so the carrier is actually going to do it for you in that case, or if you're self-funded and not an ALE. But remember, if you're self-funded, you also have the dependent information you're tracking, um, which isn't always going to be in your payroll system. It usually is going to be in some type of benefit eligibility system, um, and maybe your TPA is going to be able to help you with that. Oh, another question. Yeah, so I'm going to um, definitely share the slides, and um, there'll be a, a recording of the webinar as well that you can go back and watch. Um, I may be talking a little bit fast. Um, just wanted to make sure I got through the information, but it'll be available. Um, also, if you do have questions, you know, feel free to email me or give me a call. Um, I can probably help you out with a lot of the questions that you might have, uh, but this is um, some really critical information, I think, for a lot of employers. And it's probably one of the biggest administrative uptakes that the ACA has, has provided um, or made employers uh, go through beyond just the rate adjustments and the premiums. Okay, so I know we're out, we're out of time, and I really do appreciate everyone uh, joining the webinar today. I'm going to send a copy of the slides here um, in just a little bit, and then also a copy of the recording as well. If you feel free to get, reach out to me if you have any questions, we're more than happy to help you out and try to um, get through this first reporting period. And have a great day.